Okay, I think we should start and um, the next tutorial is uh, Professor Mukherjee from Duke on topological yeah. ideas. Ideas, right. So uh, a joking title for this talk could have been How I Learned to Count and Stop Worrying About Registration. <laughs> but uh, but we'll, we'll get there and, uh, and then it's very... I, Really excited to be here and thanks for the invitation. And uh, don't worry so much. There'll be some slides in here that are a little bit mathematical. There'll be some slides in here which are more for biologists and morphologists. But we will not go crazy in the math. So, you know, at some level, we're trying to digitize and understand representations of shapes that we can use. And uh, I, I like to show this picture to kind of ground the way that that that. I think, and I think the way a lot of uh, biologists think. So uh, this is a picture of Darwin's finches. And one of my colleagues at Duke, Susan Alberts, who I think was a fellow here in Society of Fellows a while ago, uh, pointed out something that I think is really important in that pre-Darwin, the uh, Linnaean view of organisms, right, was very platonic. You had these ideal organisms, and that's the way people started thinking about it. And I think Part of Darwin's genius and one of the reasons he thought probably and talked about evolution is he really cared about variation. So I think what we're really interested in is looking at and understanding and characterizing variation in, uh, in beaks and uh, in shapes. And so if I work with someone like Arhat, I can talk more about finches. But I work with someone who works on heel bones, so we'll come back to that. And I'll show you some data on that and comparison heel bones and primates. But if anyone wants, you know, we've mentioned Darcy Thompson, there's this great YouTube video of John Milner talking about whether the human skull and chimpanzee or baboon skulls are, are conformal, and my wife works a lot on baboons, so I find that video kind of fun. Anyways, so uh, one of the things people try to do is you take these shapes, right, these different calcanei, you measure distances between them somehow, I'll give you some ways, and then you construct a tree. And one of the things you may want to say is, does this phylogenetic tree constructed from the phenotypes or the shapes differ from a gene tree? Differ from a phylogenetic tree, you might look at a single gene or cross genes, and then you can start asking the question, is there selective pressure? Does this hint at selective pressure? And I'll come back later on to this question, and I think this is a very interesting question, and how to do this formally in the way we currently do with uh, sequences, I think is a fascinating question, but we'll get to that. Now, we talked about shapes and we talk about do you need a metric or not and things like that. So I think in some way evolution, I like to show this picture, it's broccoli. So what I'm saying is down here if I have two different uh, organisms, right, or two different trick shapes that are close by, a nice geodesic probably makes a lot of sense. Right? But if I go down, right, way down to the stock, to some common ancestor, then go back up, there's no reason there should be a continuous deformation there, right? So this, this whole idea of trying to build things necessarily on Riemannian manifolds can be a little bit tricky, right? And what I'll talk about a little bit is ways of trying to get around that a little bit, okay? Just a summary. So the classic idea, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, of, of representing shapes or what are called shape space. And this was the uh, work by David Kendall, and it's, it's very, it's actually really pretty. Uh, then there's another idea, which is this, continuous transformation idea, and uh, Anuj just spoke about the modern versions of this, right? And one can trace part of these back to Grenander and Paul Dupuy and these variational problems, and I'll show you a picture of that. What I'm going to be talking about is really this idea that people who study random fields and probability and stats started using, and some of these words may sound like a little bit intimidating, but the idea is actually really quite simple, and I'll show you pictures. And it really, it's just counting. And we'll come back to this. So one way of thinking about a shape is geometric information. Again, modulo, location, scale, and rotation. And you might not want to modulo all of those, but, but this was the idea. And this was David Kendall's idea. And partly, this idea came from thinking about data as, I don't know, you go to the museum, right? Or you go to the library. And you get an artifact, you put down a bunch of points of the artifact, and you 
write down where they are, or you write down the distances between them, and that's your data. And that made a ton of sense back in the day. But nowadays, actually, we'll, we'll get back to that. I'm sorry. So again, you just put down these landmarks, or these points of correspondences. And then I'm just defining shapes. So you're just saying two objects are similar, right, in terms of how far those landmarks or points are. Right? Once I align them, align them by t, which is rotation, translations, and scaling. And formally or mathematically, this is Kendall's shapes. Okay? Um, and these are triangles. Uh, thank you. And these are triangles, and what we're saying is that all these, this is a triangle. All of these triangles are the same. All of these triangles are the same. All of these triangles are the same, so you can think about this object. Oh. Uh, I need the. Uh, yeah, it's just for laser, it's not. Uh, not for that. Well, let's see if we can even be fancy. <laughs> yeah, we need uh, to. No, 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 don't just yeah, yeah, quit the door. Totally there fine. we go. Yeah. We're, we're, we're rocking. Okay, so, so, so now we have these databases where you can actually go in, and what's really nice is that this is what you get, right? You don't get a bunch of points you actually get a mesh. And so you can think of this as your raw data. And I'm going to come back to this. And this is actually kind of a relevant point in that if I look at the data format, these three points, this is the three coordinates, right? And then these things right here are telling me which coordinates I'm putting together to triangulate the mesh. So this is actually what the data looks like. And I'll come back to this. And mathematically, this can be constructed as what's called a simplicial complex, right? But I'll get back to that in a second. Okay. Now, this continuous Procrustes picture, or the picture on surfaces that Anuj was talking about, is I can take a bunch of teeth, I can put down some landmarks, I can draw a little region around them, and I can ask you how much energy does it take to move one to the other, right? And, and you know, versions of these are called continuous Procrustes, and my colleague Doug Boyer and my other colleague Ingrid Debashis, who I, I work with, have been really pushing this type of approach, and I, I work with them on it. But I'm going to talk about a slightly different approach today, which is using homology, and I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. So topologists love to say a coffee cup is the same as a donut, and let's let's show that. Okay, and and you really wonder any discipline that tells you <coughs> that a coffee cup is the same as a donut, maybe you shouldn't be using them for data analysis because they're, they're they're not, right? But 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 we actually will, and I'll show you how, right? Uh, but the point is, these are shapes that I can move between. I can stretch from one to the other. Now, it turns out that if I look at some data, you can't just stretch one to the other. So these are uh, fly wings, and this is from David Houle, who's a quantitative geneticist, I guess. And uh, he has uh, flies that are abnormal, so these are mutants. And if you go and actually look at them, the number of lobes are different. They lose veins, they gain veins. And my point there is that these are qualitatively different shapes in a way. And trying to continuously transform from one to the other is tricky. So there's this question, and this is what we're going to try to do, is how do I model shapes without requiring landmarks or diffeomorphisms? Right? How can I transform the data into representation that I can use standard methods for? And what we want is, ideally, this transformation should lose very little information. This transformation should be nice. I hopefully can do standard statistics or probability using them. And this is a really important point. And I think this is a point that Anuj was really stressing, which is you can transform anything any way you want. You can like look at features. If they don't come back to the original shape and mean something, then scientifically, it's really hard to say things. OK? Um, as you said, otherwise deep learning would have solved it. So, so this is what we're going to talk about. Okay. Now, partly I'm here because I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about how something called topological data analysis has come about. And uh, this, this idea of using multi-scale topology to capture geometry. Okay? And I'm going to show you pictures of how people do that. And I'm going to show you the summaries, statistical summaries, or mathematical summaries of data they use to try to do that. Um, 
And there are going to be two summaries that we talked about. One's called an Euler characteristic, and the other one's called persistent homology. Okay. Now, one question is, why, we, why do we want to use summaries? So the argument behind using summaries is the inference problem on the entire data might be hard. Okay? The inference problem on the entire data might not be robust. If I perturb the data a little bit, things could change a lot, right? And so the other question is, I might not be interested in capturing the exact geometry. I might want to ignore certain perturbations or invariants, okay? And one of the summaries I'm going to talk about is something called persistent homology. And I'm going to show you how it can possibly do it. What I want to get towards by the, uh, let's say, two-thirds away, is I want to show you how we made this picture. This is a picture telling you how similar these primate calcane and I are. Okay, then we'll go on from there and I'll show you other things. So this is a motivating example for why you might want to use topological summaries. There's a very important problem, which is telling a torus from a double torus. It keeps people up at night all the time. Okay? So if you, if you get data from a single torus, right? Each data set. That and your young one. <laughs> that and my young one, yeah. So 10 years old or the uh, double torus, right? So you have, I, I collect a bunch of uh, observations, some coming from the double torus, some coming from a single torus. Then I give a new set of points. I say, which one does it come from? So one way you can try to statistically do this is build a generative model, right, of how you get these tori, right? So that's a little bit of a pain because you actually have to write down the equation for a torus and then you have to figure out how to sample it, and, right? But once you do that, you can use just conditional probability and Bayes rule to get back that classification. Now, an alternative rule or idea is just say, hey, look, just count the number of holes, right? One or two or three. Now, putting a distribution on the number of holes turns out to be a lot easier than trying to model that entire torus or double torus. Now, there's obviously something you lose a lot. That's called information, right? <laughs> So, so there's this trade-off about how simple of a statistic you can use versus what you're losing, right? And we're trying to play some game here of, of, of thinking about smart summaries with hopefully little loss in information. Okay. So again, I just wanted to show you the data, and the data are really going to be meshes, okay, practically. Okay. These meshes, I'm going to tell you, form something mathematically called a simplicial complex, which is what I'm going to define now. Okay, simplices. A dot is a zero-dimensional simplex. A line is a one-dimensional simplex. A triangle is a two-dimensional simplex. A tetrahedron is a three-dimensional simplex. Okay? A, simple, a simplicial complex is a collection of simplices glued together. So all faces of the complex have to be in the complex. So a triangle is a face. So the edge has to exist and the dots have to exist. And simplices intersect only along common faces. I'll show you an example of things that are not. This is not legal, right? I, I can't take my triangle and just stick something in there. I can't take an edge and just take off a vertex, right? And I can't remove an edge off a triangle. So this is the idea of what a simplicial complex is. Okay. So the way I'm going to define and think about shapes right now is my shapes are meshes. They're simplicial <coughs> complexes. And that's a mathematical object that I told you. And again, this is just restating the definition. Now, because I do topology, and because I work with some people who really like to do abstract math, this is how they wanted to define the shape. Okay? And I'll get through this, and there's a reason why I'm telling you this, and don't worry about the details. So this is a very set view of what a shape is. Right? One view of thinking about a shape is there are these meshes, another view is continuous, I can write down a physical function, or I can write down a curve. Uh, if you want to be as abstract of a mathematician as possible, this is what you try to do. You define something called an ominimal structure, which is basically saying if I project in any coordinate direction, right, I still get something that's like a shape. Okay? And that's what I'm saying in here. And then I also make one statement. You basically are getting things that are finite unions of points and open intervals. So the reason why we're saying all of this is that I'm going to think in some way of shapes as sets. And I'm going to ask about changes in these sets as I go along any axis parallel direction. And I'm going to count certain things that change, 
which I'll define really soon. Okay? Now, constructible sets are a collection of compact definable subsets of RD. <coughs> this is just a formal definition. A mesh is fine here. Just think about a mesh, okay? A constructible function is if I sweep, think about it this way. I have a shape. If I sweep it in any direction, somehow it doesn't change all the time, okay? Formally, I'm going to show you what a critical point is, and we're going to talk about how many times a critical point can change. But it's somehow saying that, you know, this is not fractal. It's, it's got some notion of smoothness or not craziness, okay? And I will make this more clear, okay? Okay, great. So the first statistic we're going to look at is something called the Euler character which for meshes is number of vertices minus number of edges plus number of faces in 3D. And it's a topological invariant, so it's the same for the sphere, for the square, for this ellipse. This is what it is for the uh, donut, right? And for Swiss cheese, it's always negative 30. Um, it's a nice statistic. Okay. The other object that we're going to look at is something called a height function. And so this is a bone. I'm going to take a perpendicular plane, and we're going to start going through it. And I'll show you how we go through it. And we're going to do this for many directions. Okay, and so here's an example. <coughs> this is a mouse embryo heart. And I'm sweeping in this direction A, and I look at the sublevel set. This is my height function, and this is called a sublevel set. And I can compute the Euler characteristic of that. So if I take a hand, and I sweep from below all the way up, right? I'm just sweeping through. And I'm asking you when the vertices and edges change, this count of vertices and edges change. This is a picture I get. This is called the Euler characteristic curve, and it's for this hand. Okay? And sometimes I might want to integrate that in zero mean it, and you'll see why I do that later on. That's kind of the second part of the talk. Okay. So that's one summary. Now, there's something called critical points. Critical points are minimum, maximum, and inflection points. And these are different types of critical points. And basically, this Euler characteristic curve is changing whenever you hit a critical point. Right? So we're counting critical points. Okay? So this is why I'm telling you, in a way, we're just counting. Okay. okay. So now I'm going to tell you about the other summary, which is called persistent homology. Topologists really like Betty numbers. Okay? Betty zero or zero homology is the number of connected components. One homology is the number of one cycles with number of holes. Two homology is the number of voids. And do not ask me to physically interpret three homology. Okay? Now, if I look at these things, Betty zero is two, because there are two of them. Betty one is zero because there are no one cycles, and there are no two cycles because these holes are. <coughs> These spheres are solid. Here, there's one connected component, Betty 0 is 1. There's one hole, so Betty 1 is 1. Betty 2 is 0 because it's filled in. For the sphere, Betty 2 is 1 because there's a void inside. Betty 1 is 0, and Betty 0 is 1. Okay. And for, by sphere, you really mean the surface? I mean the surface, exactly. I really mean the surface. Okay. So this is a notion of Betty numbers. Now, one of the things that's absolutely, completely amazing is along time ago, all of this construction, right, could be turned into algebra. You can basically use linear algebra to construct and tell you what these Betty 0, Betty 2, Betty 1s are, and that was really the genius of any noter. So that's just an aside. Now the version of homology that we're going to use in the analysis is based upon something called Morse theory, and I'm going to give you a 10... 30 second introduction to Morse theory using pictures. Okay? This is a more advanced field than what I'm showing. It's beautiful, it's rich. But what I'm pretending is <coughs> I'm back in North Carolina a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, and there's a big storm coming. And fortunately, I don't live in New Bern, but the rivers are rising. Okay? I'm going to say as the rivers rise, what happens to connected components here? And that's a question about Betty Zero. Okay. So the first thing when the rivers rise is I notice that I see a feature down here. Right? This is the first point that you hit as a water rises. Okay, so the next point you hit as the water rises is here, right? And this has gotten filled in a little bit. 
go a little bit further, something is happening here, right? This got filled in a little bit. And then when I go a little bit up, what you notice is this was separate from this, but now they merged. Okay? So if I think about this as a picture, right, this object was born here. This is the first time this connected component showed up. And then this thing was born later on. And this thing died very quickly because a little bit later, it got eaten by the other one. So that's a birth and a death. Okay? And so I can just go up and go through this entire connected object. And this is called a persistence diagram. It is a summary of the critical points. Whenever something changed, it changed at a critical point. And this is giving me pairings of critical points in a way tracking. Okay? And again, this is a summary of your data. Now, formally, what we'll actually do is, remember I showed you that, that heel bone, and I showed you a plane, and I showed you that I was filtering through it, right? And I was looking at Euler characteristic curves and how this thing changed. I can do persistent homology there as well. I can basically take that plane right through the object, and I can construct a very similar type of diagram. And I actually will. Here's another way people think about persistent homology. They define filtrations. Filtrations <coughs> are formal subsets of each other, but I have a bunch of points, okay? I want to think of this as an object, right? Now, for a topologist, this is stupid, right? Because it's, the, it's just, if any zero is the number of points you have and everything else is, there's nothing. But then I can start thinking. And I can start saying, okay, when do I start getting one entire connected component? When do I start seeing a one cycle, right? So at this point, a one cycle was born. Later on, that one cycle disappeared. And the last thing that's going to happen is this thing's going to fill in, right? So in a way, you can think of this was data sample from a torus, slightly thickened. And I'm looking at what changes as I thicken the data. This is a multi-scale notion of persistent homology. And so what persistent homology is doing is it's just tracking when I get a change in a homology process. When does Betty zero change as I think it? When does Betty one change as I think it? Right? That, that's what it's capturing. Okay? And formally, this persistence diagram, you can think of it as a bunch of points. The diagonal has infinite multiplicity. I'll tell you what I mean by that. And all these points are above the diagonal because things can't die before they're born. Okay? Now, this is any statistic you ever use should probably be somewhat stable. So if this is a curve, I have the red curve and I have the blue curve, okay? Give rise to a red diagram and a blue diagram, and I can try to measure the distance between these two diagrams. Red diagram and a blue diagram for the Betty zero. For, for Betty zero here, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, in higher dimensions, we could look at Betty one as well, but here it's just Betty zero, so we're exactly. This is exactly the Morse function picture I wanted to show you. Now, you can measure the distance between the red and the blue by basically just trying to find the nearest points, right? And then for points that don't match, you just match them to the diagonal. And so basically, I'm looking at a bijection between the points x and y, red to blue, and I try to find the set of bijections that minimize the squared error, okay? There are other versions of this. I could have put a p here, and it could be called the lp Wasserstein metric. The L-infinity version is called the bottleneck distance, but you can start putting, and you can make more clever metrics. So people think about making clever metrics. Can I push you a little bit more yeah. on that? I mean, I've seen Wasserstein being used, and I always wonder what's the reason of this particular choice, but you just said there are other possibilities. Yeah, absolutely. Too. So, I mean, the, the popularity of Wasserstein, why? I mean, why Wasserstein? Maybe too? because the way you said it, these bijections are needed. And so I use a two Wasserstein because I also do a lot of probability work and do things on Markov chains, so I'm happy with the Wasserstein too. But practically, actually, this is not the best metric. And there are people like Steve Ado and others who've come up with much nicer metrics, which have, uh, in a way, better pro properties. I mean, properties is one thing, but there should be a sort of interpretability of, like, the, these things are being introduced in uh, births and deaths or somehow the cost, you know, let's say in my problem, there is a cost to these things. So, I should show up to the so okay, so, so I, I, I'll come back to this. Now, now my, I have a very basic bias. I'm a Bayesian statistician. What it means to be a Bayesian statistician is you believe in two things. You believe that there is a generative process, 
right? And that has a likelihood, and you believe that as much as you can, you have priors on your parameters and your models, okay? Now, in a lot of what I'm talking about, and what I've stated here, is I have, in a way, deeply violated the first principle of the innovation statistician, which I've completely ignored the generative process. I've gone straight to some summary and arbitrary metrics on summaries, okay? So what the field needs is this question of how I push forward a notion of a likelihood onto these summaries, right? And that would suggest what metrics make more or less sense, because that would suggest what your noise model is, okay? So I've pushed all that under the rug. I've just told you this is one metric. I will use it on real data. I'll show you what the results are. I promise you this is not the best. I have a colleague of mine, Catherine Hess, at um, EPFL, has been looking at, uh, actually what you're talking about at the end, she's been looking at these neural trees. And she's looking, using other metrics here that I think are much better. Okay, but this is a choice. We'll go on. I have quibbles with this as well. Another question, I think. Yeah, sorry, yes. Uh, so what happens if you sweep in different directions? Is it invariant? Invariant to what? Like, what the answer you get. So what we'll actually do is we'll sweep in many, many directions. And as I go on in this talk, I'll tell you that there's really interesting and pretty geometry there. Okay? I'll even answer the question of how many directions you need. Okay? We'll get there. Yeah. So, okay. excuse me. Yeah. So, this are invertible too? I will answer this question of well, whether it's invertible or not as well. So the point is, if you go in any direction, you lose a lot, ton of information. However, the argument is, if I take enough directions, hopefully I don't lose a ton of information. And I'm going to quantify that. Okay? Okay, so all we want to say is that if these functions are similar, the diagrams should be similar. What we really, really, really want to say is you can go back in the other direction. But that's not true. You can't go back in the other direction. You just take one direction. Okay. Now, this is a formal way of saying what the Euler characteristic transform is. Okay. All it's doing is you're saying that M is a mesh. This is my fancy way of saying a mesh. But M is a mesh. And what the Euler characteristic transform does is looking at directions on the sphere. Each direction on the sphere is one of your sweeps. And it transforms what we did into a set of Euler curves, which are these up and down integer things. Okay? So that is what the Euler characteristic is. Another way you can think about it is take your shape, go in direction V, up to distance T, that's your sublevel set, intersect that with the mesh, right, and compute the Euler characteristic. And just sweep. This is a notion of the smooth Euler characteristic curve. You take the original Euler characteristic curve, integrate it, subtract out the mean. And what's nice is now you've taken a shape and turned it into a curve, an L2. Now, statistically, what's nice about this is what Manuj said earlier. Statisticians really, really can do a lot with curves. There's an entire area of functional data analysis which was discussed where we could measure distances between curves, we can model curves, we can do a ton of curves. So now I have to tell you, just take a shape. Turn it into a collection of curves, and then model those. Right? So that's basically the philosophy. So can I, yeah. can I just clarify something? You're always, when you calculate this other characteristic transform, working with a hyperplane, which is one-dimensional, smaller than... That's exactly right. Now, there's no reason why... Because you I, could have done it... Yeah. I could have done it with local hyperplanes. Yeah. I could have done... I, what I'll tell you later on, towards the end of the talk, is I'm doing signal processing. This is nothing but doing signal processing with a different type of integral. It's not the usual type of Riemann integral we use. It's what's called an Euler integral. And you can choose whatever filter or, or object you want on that. right? But I'm doing the most brain dead <coughs> simple thing right now. Okay? I'm just seeing how far we can get with that. So always co-dimension one. Always co-dimension one. Okay. So now we could have done the same thing with persistent homology. So it's just mapping, you take a direction, it maps it into a diagram. This is a diagram for Betty 0, Betty 1, blah, 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 up to dimension D minus 1. Okay? So that's what the persistent homology is. For anyone who cares, there's a commutative diagram. I don't think anyone cares. Okay. So what you can actually do now is measure distances between shapes. I take my first shape, go in direction V, I get a curve, 
take shaft two, go in direction V, get a curve, smooth them, and just take the difference between them, for example. Integrate this over all directions. My computer does not want to integrate over all directions. You have to discretize, and we'll talk about that discretization soon. Okay. Could have done the same thing with the diagram. Take the shape, go in direction V, shape two, direction V, measure the distance between these two persistence diagrams, integrate it over all directions, okay? And I will show you results. Now there's this question of how many directions do you need, right? And this, versions of this idea have been studied because a very classic example of this integral geometry idea, or this topological idea, is something called the <coughs> right? right? And this is how we do like micro CTs, for those of you who work with micro CTs. I take my object, I do a ton of x-rays from many, many directions, right? And then there's this question of, given these many projections of these x-rays, how do I get back my original shape, okay? And people can do this, there are constraints, there are nice work done in this, and there's a, this next slide is the most abstract version of this, answer to this question. So Pierre Shapira, who uh, is a mathematician, gave a very, very, very weak topological conditions under which that inversion works, okay? And the only reason why I'm showing this slide, we don't need to worry about all of this, is we kind of have adapted those ideas to what we're doing. Now, there's a reason why I have a few names here, and, uh, and, I, I, and there's something I just wanted to say. So the first kind of idea of looking at these shapes and surfaces using these kind of uh, sweeps in different directions that, that we did was with a colleague, longtime colleague of mine, uh, Catherine Turner, who's a mathematician, and then a colleague of mine, Doug Boyer, who's a morphologist. And, and we showed that this is injective, where you don't lose information if you take enough directions. And we did this in a very kind of almost algorithmic way. We almost give an algorithm for being able to put piece these back together. Okay? And then later on, we, uh, we, we didn't include Doug because it became almost pure abstract math, and we showed under these very abstract topological situations. You can do it, some other people did it as well around that, but the point is you can both invert these two. The only reason I put this up is there's one point I want to make, which is there's this very abstract area, or somewhat abstract area of geometry and topology called sheets. And what was nice is this result and our result are one of the, kind of, I would say, first versions of using sheets for actually a real practical Problem. Okay. Question: How many directions? So, so, Sign going back to the integration over the directions. Yes. How do you know that for this object the direction v1 should be matched with the same v1, or it could be a different v1? So this is a serious issue. Okay. So some so there's something I've hit under the rug, which I was going to come back to, but you just nailed me on it, right? So I'm assuming that someone, as best as they can, has registered all of these, right? Rotationally. So, rotationally, right? Okay. Right? I, I've, I've assumed that. Now, that's not a trivial thing to do. I've, I've actually worked on this problem, and it's a pain in the ass. Uh, but, but I'm assuming that that's there. I'm going to give you a version where we relax that in a few slides. But, and now I'm just saying that all the directions, I think, you know, mean the same Can't thing. Can't you build the registration inside the metric itself? You have a metric. You could. You could. Just put an infimum you, overall. You, you could. Yes. Do you have an idea about the, the continuity of this mapping? With yes, I actually do, and I was going to talk about that in a second. Okay. So this mapping is Lipschitz, and you can so what? what I, so th this mapping, right? If I were to change the shape somewhat, uh, the, the 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 metric or the distance will be smooth, okay? And it'll be smooth in an infinity point. This mapping is less smooth. There, this mapping is actually practically sometimes more useful. I'll talk to you about this when I do regression with shapes. But this, this mapping is, is less smooth. There's, I think often we see this in statistics and in topological data analysis and other things is you have these summaries of your data that are more complicated and have more information. And often those summaries in some way have nicer distance information between them. But they become very hard to use statistically because they don't have nice 
square differences or inner products, they, they, they lose some niceness. Yeah. Are you going to tell us through examples or otherwise when you might use Euler transform versus yes, persistent? Yes, I will actually do that. So now there's this question of how many directions to sample. So for 2D, we found 162 directions is perfect. And for 3D, you need over 7. This is purely arbitrary, right? So there's this question of how many directions do you need? And then I'm going to show you a little bit of how to think about that, OK? And so you can actually think of this as a sampling theory for shapes. How complex is a shape, right, or a family of shapes? How do I think about this? And uh, there's a beautiful paper that's related to this. Yeah, can I ask a question in that context? Because again, problem that came up in, or not problem, but the question that came up in Anuraj's talk about scale dependent. So if yes. I have simplicials of different scales, presumably you can coarse grain some of them by collapsing. You could. Are you going to tell us about how one might approach that scale dependent way? No. Uh, I, I've thought about it a little bit, but I, I, I don't have a very good answer to that. Um, because the notion of persistence itself is somehow scale dependent, is it? The notion of persistence itself is scale dependent, right? So, so yes, there are ways of kind of collapsing this, and I guess maybe yeah. Towards the end of the talk, I'll show, I'll draw some pictures on the board that illustrate some ideas, but I do not have a clean answer to your question. But so I will touch back up. Yeah. Can you say like once you reach the the persistence diagram, and you, if you change the scale of the object, the diagram scales in some fashion. It does. The metric that you're using to comp can that metric be scale invariant in the persistence diagram? Um, That's why yeah. you know Fischer Rao versus Wasserstein. Fischer Rao yeah. is invariant yes. to the axis. Um, you're asking me a very hard question, and I'll tell you why. The diagram. Persistence diagrams have a space. They live in a yeah. geometry, OK? This geometry is terrible. You do not have unique geodesics in this geometry. It's, it's what's called an Alexandrov space bounded from below by 0. It's a terrible space, OK? But the, uh, the Euler space is much nicer. It's an L2 space. So in that space, a lot of the things they're doing, yes. Right? Just, just pick a metric which is invariant to some of those things right. you want to be invariant to. Yes. So in the, in, in, in the, in the uh, again, when we look at the other characteristics curve space, yes, we could do that. I, it would be hard in the persistent space. Okay. So this is this really nice paper by Arnold where he said, if I tell you where the critical points are for a curve, okay, he asks the question, how many topologically different functions, ones that you can't stretch to each other, are there that can give you these critical points. And he writes down a closed form solution, which is amazing. Now, it turns out trying to do this in 2D is really hard, because it's really hard to order in 2D. 1D ordering is very easy, and fundamental to this problem is ordering. But in a way, that's what we're trying to do. So if I give you a family of shapes, <coughs> that's M. D is a dimension that it's living in, three. K is the number. K is the number of critical points in any direction. I'm going to say, I'm going to maximize it. I'm going to say it can't be bigger than, than little k, OK? And then at each vertex, I have a lower bound on curvature. But if you give someone this, you can play 20 questions, which is basically saying, if you give me this many directions, I can tell apart two shapes. This is an astronomic number. It's kind of stupid. But in theory, you can tell apart any shape given a fixed number of directions. Now, there's a really interesting. Sorry, what are those uh, parameters, d, delta, and k? So, d is a dimension you're embedding in. Delta is a lower bound on the curvature. And k is a number of critical points. You maximum number of critical points in any direction. Delta is lower or upper bound? Lower bound. So, 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 the question is things that are very flat are hard to tell apart, it turns out. Like, as, as a statistician, I think curvature is a lot of information because it's low variance, right? So, so that's what's going on here. Now, there's a very practical version of this that we're working on, which is um, coming up with an algorithm which say, let's say I have 50 shapes, right? These are 50 shapes of, um, an example would be someone's arm, or maybe the breast of a woman. And what you want to do is do a CT scan of them, but you don't want to radiate the person too much, because you're trying to detect the breast cancer. Right, because you might want to go do this again and again and again. Right? So can you give me a minimal number of directions such that I get as much information as possible to try to do this? And I actually started thinking about this problem when I 
was working with meerkats, which I'll show you at the end. But, but so this is actually an interesting problem, which is uh, making this more useful. Okay. Okay. Now, I want to show you a picture and 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 then tell you a little bit about it, and then I'll start showing you real results in a second. Okay. So one way you can think about this is this is a sphere, and if I go in any direction of the sphere, what do I get? I get a curve, right? Which is basically telling me where the changes are happening. So if I go in this direction, I get ch change happened here, 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 and here. Okay? Now I can ask you the question, if I go in a slightly different direction, right, can you tell me what the curve would look like? And what the previous result, and what we're showing here, is that either the persistent homology transform or the Euler characteristic transform is chopping up the spheres into little planes. And each of these little planes, you have a linear function that turns this one into what would happen there. Right? And that's why you have this nice structure. And I think this is what I was getting at when I was answering your question, right? So you're really chopping the sphere up into different parts. And those different parts are where it starts self-occluding or things like that, right? <coughs> and so one way of actually thinking about modeling shapes is draw random points, make this a point process in any direction, and now you just have a mixture of these point processes, right? And in theory, you should be able to pull that back to a shape. And I'll get back to the inversion thing. And this is this question that we'd like to get towards a sufficient statistic. So a lot of TDA, right, I think a lot of Anuja's complaints about features are because they're summary statistics, right? They don't give you all the information. They don't let you come back. And so this is this idea of how far can we get towards something that is a sufficient statistic. Okay, alignment is a pain. So one way of thinking about this problem is think about directions as random, right? Each of the directions are random. And so now what I'm really telling you is that for shape one, I have a collection of random curves. Shape two, I have another collection of random curves, okay? So now can you define a distance between a collection of random curves and another collection of random curves? We know from probability theory, in theory, you can, right? If these were just collections of curves and there was a measure on them, I could look at Wasserstein, I could look at various other divergence metrics. If I give you empirical ones, I can measure empirical distances, okay? So that's what this theorem is telling you, is that if I have two shapes, K1 and K2, I think about these random directions, I push them forward, I get random curves, right? These two distributions are going to be similar for some rotation. So this is a theorem. We're trying to see empirically how good this is. This is where it's still in progress. Okay. Now, the reason why we went to this smooth Euler characteristic curve is that if I have these nice curves, I can write down models like this. What's nice about a model like this is I can define an inner product. Uh, basically, I can define a correlation. I have a nice linear correlation structure. And so what can I do? I take a shape, I have k different directions, k different curves, I discretize it into t different points, now I have a matrix. Right? I know how to put probability <coughs> distributions on matrices. This is called a matrix variant normal. It has three parameters. It has a mean matrix, it has a covariance u, which is telling me the covariance between curves, and it has a covariance v, which is telling me the covariance between points in a curve. And so I can start writing down likelihood models for shapes and surfaces. This is interesting as a first step. And I'll mention this later. What I really want to do at some point is I want to do proper phylogenetics with these shapes. Now, if you do classical phylogenetic problems, you have sequences, right? And you have a likelihood model on these sequences, ACTGs or protein sequences. What's really tricky, though, and we'll come back to this later on, the other thing if you have in phylogenetics is you have a substitution model between those letters. And a substitution model on shapes is really hard. But it's interesting. But, but again, you can start defining likelihoods. And if you want to be <coughs> non-parametric, they're non-parametric models. Okay. And, and behind this formulation is the assumption of L2 norm in the function space. Yes, exactly. OK, so I'll show you data just, and some results. Maybe, I don't know, someone might care about that. You think. You think, right? <laughs> and this will also start 
at answering your question about where we use the order characteristic versus the persistent homology. So we had the heel bones of 106 primates. Okay? We used the persistent homology transform because it worked better. For distance-based things, the persistent homology transform works better because it's smoother. Just Two axes there. Get to that in one second. I got pairwise distances between all of these objects. I did multidimensional scaling. And the two axes are the two greatest functions <coughs> of variation. And how do you do the registration out for these? So these were pre-registered. They were pre-registered with something called Auto3DGM, which is code that we'd worked on. And the way that code works, and I'll come back to this in much more detail, is you take, registration is a pain in the ass, okay? So the typical way we, we did it is you take two shapes and you register. That's relatively easy, because it's just rotation, scaling, blah, 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 okay? Now what's really hard is how you make this commensurate across all pairwise distances, okay? And I'll draw, actually, I'll draw a picture of that in a little bit. Actually, let me draw the picture now. Okay, so what you do is you have a bunch of objects. Right, these are all my shapes. Initially, I can do a pairwise between every single one of them, okay? What you should never believe are distances for any two objects that are very far apart. Those are usually really, really shady. Okay, so what you can do is first compute all these pairwise distances. Think of this as a graph. Okay, now I have this graph. Construct a minimal spanning tree on that graph. Right, so kind of find paths that are short. For example, maybe it's here. Okay, construct some sort of minimal spanning tree. Now recompute the distances on the minimal spanning tree. Okay, that gives me a new, new graph, right? And then keep iterating this until it stabilizes. So that's one way of doing this registration. Okay, there's a, there's there's actually a very interesting geometric picture behind this process, if you generalize and think about it more, which is very closely related to what Anuj was talking about, which is let me just redraw them. I have a bunch of points. Okay, these are my shapes. Okay, one view of the world is there's a manifold structure that that all of these shapes sit on. So these are points, there's some manifold here. Okay, now I'm going to take each shape and I'm going to put a little bar over it. Those bars are all of my, uh, what are they called, landmarks, right? Or if it's continuous, it's every single point. Or it could be all of a vector bundle, right? Or every single fan tangent or vector bundle. You can try to make this more and more abstract. So you have all of these sitting here, okay? And basically, you can say, how similar is this to this? Right? And there are different ways you could think about that group transformations, diffeomorphisms, <laughs> what we talked about, procrustes distance, right? Now, one of the things that's really going to be true is that if I go from here to here, I go back to here, and I come back here, okay, hopefully I get the same set of landmarks back, right? In, in, in geometry, this is called a holonomy, right? It's if you just come back in a loop, you get back the identity, you get back the same thing. Now, what is true in general for these shapes is not everything's going to let you come back into a, a loop because they're kind of broken from each other, right? So this picture of the world that there's this nice underlying Riemannian structure, it goes back to broccoli, right? If you didn't have broccoli, this would be purely Riemannian. Because you have broccoli and things break the further down I go, you have things that are locally Riemannian, but then they kind of dis distort, okay? And so one interesting idea is how do we think about these continuous deformation ideas, but kind of break them when we need to, okay? That was a very long-winded answer, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so this is a picture. Ah. Can I ask one quick question? Yeah, you said um, persistent homology works better with distance space versus why? I didn't hear the last part of your sentence. So, okay, so the reason why I tell you if you're trying to measure distances between things, why I encourage using persistent homology is because of the question that he asked, which is he asked me about continuity of these different transforms. And the persistent homology transform has better continuity properties. It has more information, it's smoother. Okay? So, okay, let's see. Uh, these are all apes. For a while I was calling a gibbon a great ape, which is terrible, it's a worse rate, but it's great. This is not a spider, it's a spider monkey. This is not a squirrel, it's a squirrel monkey. 
And, and for a while I was also saying, saying these are all old world monkeys, but spider monkey is not, it's a new world monkey, right? And, uh, and these are all new world monkeys, and these are all lemurs. My colleague Doug makes prettier pictures. This is the same thing, but using software called Test. And this is also telling you what the groups are. And uh, I'm sure there are people here who know strepsorines and platyrines much better than myself. So I'll let you look at it. So Doug told me something, which at first meant no, had no meaning to me. He said that he liked our approach better because the hylobates were with the other apes. And previously, the hylobates were with the aluata. And I got this email, and I had no idea what that was. <laughs> so it turns out it's very useful for me. Well, my wife's a biologist. She explained to me what it meant. And uh, what it meant is that the uh, gibbons were now with the apes, for good or for bad. OK. So this is just comparing a Procrustes-based method using our method using a continuous Procrustes or diffeomorphism method. So the, just to understand, yeah. the colors are the biologists' yes, phylogeny. That's exactly and, right. and I see some overlap and some intersections based on what you were doing using MDS, using the persistent model. That's model. exactly right. And you're going to tell us something about I, if I had not trained a trained biologist looking at this, you would have classified them differently. If I were asked to classify this, right, it's a question of what I would do, right? I'm not sure what I would do. I'd probably group all of these together. Yeah, because there's a clear... Because there's a clear, right? I, I, well, that's, isn't that part of the question, is that how can you start doing unsupervised classes? I think that's exactly part of the question. So the part of the question <coughs> is if you have some of these information, now I throw in an extra new organism, right? Which one will it go to, right? And what we'll talk about later on is how do you <coughs> link these shapes to particular traits, ecological or evolutionary, right? And, and yes, I'm sorry. So related to the... To the, what you were getting at just before you said ecology, if you go to the other diagram with the colors on it, the phylogenetic sampling is not the same across these different groups, whatever those groups They're mean. They're not. And so you would draw different shapes if your phylogenetic sampling was, were different. So I'm wondering if you're going to get to phylogenetic correction. So I, I will get to it in a little bit. So, 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 so when you think about doing regression, let's say we were trying to regress on a shape, OK? Um, you would want to build in like a mixed model, right? You basically want to correct for this phylogenetic structure. And, and I'll, I will mention that later on, right? Um, so yeah, so yeah. Yes. Can you go to the statement that your biologist made? So I think philosophically I have. I, I, I'd like to make just one. Oh, yeah, please do. I, I wouldn't say Doug is my biologist. I'd say my biologist, but Doug was one of the biologists that I work with a lot. But yes, absolutely. In this particular set, he That's was your biologist. He was. This particular so, I find. I don't have one. And, and this goes to the sort of phylogeny question, also from the back. I find this a little bit dangerous. Because it says, yeah. oh, this is the one that agrees with what I thought the best. So I think this is, no, this is a great point. And this is a point that drives me a little bit crazy, is that I do a lot of work in statistical genetics. And it's easier for me to do work there to know, because there's a null model, right? I, I, I build a null model, I see how something varies from that null model, and then I say it's interesting or not. And one of the things that's really hard, I find, in a lot of... Um, Morphometrics is that we don't have good clean null models, right? So, so we're just saying something, well, this is what I think, this is what I believe, right? A lot of our registration, how do we validate things? People stare at them, and they say, hey, look, this, these look like the landmarks that I know about and I care about, right? And, and I don't know how immediately how to go beyond that. What I would like to do is build null models, build some more statistical evidence into this, use resampling as another approach to get some motion of uncertainty, right? But I don't know how to more rigorously answer this question without having a null model, right? It could be statistical. Another way, it could be developmental. We have different kind of default mental growth models, give rise to different shapes, use that, right, to kind of get this from notion of distribution. But I don't know how to answer your question. <laughs> I mean, you can do things like building in like, like a Brownian model of how you expect shapes to evolve, you know, which some people have done. But that's, of course, a huge assumption. So I, I will actually get back to that. So so I have done Bernstein-Ollenbeck models for other things like methylation. 
right? The problem with the Brownian motion model, right, with Ornstein Olenbeck is just Brownian motion with the drift. The, the problem you have, shapes under a Brownian motion model can go through themselves, right? Now you can make things very localized so they don't, but then you can only look at things that are kind of really nearby each other. So, so this is why building a null model on shape space is tremendously hard. I think it's very important to do, right? Doing it more clearly or correctly is really hard. Okay. So there's a there's a mathematical question that sits behind this, right? So just qualitatively, we said, okay, we won, we did better, you can do simulations, you can do other things. But there's this very tricky and interesting mathematical question is what is the gold standard distance between two shapes? Right? This is this is a non-trivial question. There are very complicated metrics based on sets, like the gramov hausdorff distance. It's completely unstable. You don't want to use it. It empirically will not work. Uh, we know that for certain cases, there's theory of something called Hadwiger transformations, which should be how close things are. But, but just generalizing this further and asking this gold standard question is, is tricky. It's, it's mathematically not tricky. Okay. I want to get towards regression on shapes, uh, and we'll get to that pretty fast. Can I ask you a yeah. question before you go to this? So, you, so your representation, you start with an object, and for different directions, you get these different curves, yeah. and you said that if you have enough directions, this mapping is invertible. Yeah. But that is, do you know how to actually invert it? I will get back to that. Okay. I'll show you a picture. Okay. Okay. So, so sometimes people care about brain tumors and biomedical applications, so this is a glioblastoma. And what we're doing is, this is a gene expression data. These are morphometric features that radiologists have kind of pre-selected. These are just five numbers that don't have much meaning. And these are the, uh, the transforms, the homology transforms. And here we're using the Euler characteristic, and there's a very good reason why, which I'll get to in a second. And there are three responses, disease-free survival and overall survival. <coughs> and what we want to do is say, which of these features best explains variation in survival? Okay? And the reason we use the Euler characteristic curve here is it fits very nicely into regression models. Okay, so there are these nonlinear regression models called kernel models or Gaussian processes, where basically all you do is take all of your data points, and on each data point you put a little bump. Okay, and your regression function is a linear combination of bumps. Okay, that's what I'm showing you. Now these kernel functions can either be just correlations, or they can be distances between you know, these matrices, for example. And then once I have these distances, I can define something called a Gaussian kernel, so called a Cauchy kernel. These are two of the ones we'll use. <coughs> and then we can ask for which of these do we get better or worse predictions in terms of disease-free survival. And what you find is that we do a little bit better with, uh, with our method. Now, what's interesting is gene expression doesn't do very well. It's too unstable. Methylation would probably have done better. And the more nonlinear, heavier tail kind of kernels tend to do better. Uh, so all we're trying to show here is you can start now describing how the shape is correlated to some phenotype that you're interested in. Now, there's a, let me see one other thing. You can, there's this question about why the hell would something topological have anything to do with disease-free survival, right? And in certain cases, the surgeons know that it, they do. If, if Betty zero is very large, if you have a bunch of little small tumors, right, the, sometimes the probability of it becoming uh, metastatic goes higher. In certain types of breast tumors, uh, surgeons know that if it's a sphere with a void in the middle, so you have like a bunch of dead stuff in the middle, uh, you have better prognosis for those. That's Betty two. So an interesting, important question, I think, is what do these geometric and topological features have to do with the underlying physiology and molecular biology of invasion and other things like that? And understanding that better is, is really important. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. In any of these tumors or whatever, if the shape doesn't change but the properties, like the elastic properties change, how does that fit into or it doesn't have any... So, like so that's a great question, and I think that's what I was thinking about. Right? In a way, what I'm hinting at is that the real thing is not the shape. In a way, the real thing are these electric, elastic properties, the property, probability of things becoming more kind of invasive, sticky, right? And, and the one question is, 
to somehow shape correlate, right? And there's a greater global thing. There's something called radiogenomics, which is going in and taking methylation or doing biopsies is hard, right? It's very expensive. You know, it's not fun for the patient, right? So how much of these imaging technologies can we pull back those types of that information from, right? And I, I think you really need to do physics-based models. You need to go in and do the, you know, the molecular biology and the physiology to understand that better. Yeah. Maybe just continuing along that, if I just use, as you said, you know, this is all very closely related to things like the radon transform. If I weight the radon transform appropriately so that depending on the path, uh, sorry, not depending on the path length, but I weight the path length by the kind of property, then wouldn't I essentially, if I had information about the property, get a weighted version of the Euler characteristic I think transform you, yes. or the persistent homology? Yes, you should. I mean, it would make sense to do that. And like, for example, you know, if you look at the uh, the colon and the crypt, right, there's a very particular structure that we know that they grow in, right? So in one way, you can even weight it by not taking other directions because you know, right? But yeah, exactly. That would be very interesting. Uh, so this is the last part. So I'll go through this quickly so you can look at, uh, talk about questions. You can say, what parts of the shape are most associated with variation? This was your question. Can you invert? Can you tell me what sub-images right, are the most relevant? You can think of this as variable selection or sub-image selection. So I'll give you the data set we're looking at. We're still working on this. Uh, so this is work in progress. I have 50 molars from five different primate genera. We're now looking at working with the uh, tumors in this case. because. We supposedly understand this better. Okay, these are the five different primates. Okay? They're all very nice. They have molars. And so this is the idea. We take the different species, we turn them into these Euler curves. We associate the Euler curves to the phenotype, which is what do you eat? Oh yeah, by the way, I know that some of these things eat mainly leaves, some of these things eat mainly fruits, some of these eat mainly insects. We correlate to that, and we want to come back and tell you which parts of the shapes are most relevant to do this, okay? Uh, so, yeah. So, this is a picture of how we do it. So, this, these are just different directions. These are these slightly different directions. And that was that picture I was drawing here. And for these different directions, as I scan through, where I hit the curve, this is my shape, are going to be slightly different points, okay? And basically, from these three Euler characteristic curves, I can come back and triangulate that point in theory, okay? So this is really a ray tracing or a projective geometry inversion argument, okay? And that, that's how we're actually doing it, right? But there are a lot of parameters. How many directions do you go in? How big of a cone to use, right? So we're trying to figure out how to set all of those in a stable way right now. And also how finally you sample. How finally you sample is a really important parameter, right? So we're working on all of these things right now, which is why I can't give you definitive results. And what's even actually really tricky, and we're working hard on this, is how do you build a reasonable model where you know what's going on? How do I do simulations of shapes where I actually control the differences between the different classes or with the, with the, with the, uh, with the shape? So we're building random field models where we can actually stick in where the differences are and trying to do this a little bit more carefully. And it, it, it's tricky. It's actually somewhat tricky. But this is the inversion question that we're working on. I just want to show you one last picture, and then I'll tell you what we're looking for. So I, I know from an unsupervised analysis, you can tell these apart. Right? So this is an unsupervised analysis. And this is a method that, remember I was showing you a picture here, and I've seen some of these cluster and have holonomy, some of them don't. So this is a method that can break those. And when you break those, they start clustering a little bit more nicely into the, into what these things eat, right? And if you just <coughs> break them and use something that's just more of a continuous diffusion, that happens less. That's just what this picture is showing. And this is why we think we should be able to do regression on this. Because if you can do something unsupervised, you should really be able to do it supervised. OK, things we do. Localizing this transformed, right? This is signal processing. You take a signal you, 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 that, you, that you have you're interested in. You take similar sub-signals like Fourier or, or dictionary elements or whatever. Correlate them. Write down how correlated they are. That's your summary statistic. This is classical signal processing. You can think we're doing the same thing here, just using different form of integration. 
you're using something called Euler integration. Similarly, you can do dictionary learning. For those of you who know that, I can tell you more. I told you about reconstructing shapes. This, I think, is a really, really interesting question. How do you do proper phylogenetics in this space? And how do you build substitution models? This is something that I'm really interested in and I can just talk very briefly about, is how to extend procrustes, continuous procrustes, diffeomorphism-based approaches to the case where not everything is diffeomorphic. It's just diffeomorphic in patches. I think is a uh, really interesting question. Um, graphs and networks. So these are my collaborators. Um, these are a lot of people who I talked to. They're people who funded me. A while ago, I went to a technical school down the road. This was my favorite bar, which is shut down, and I think it's like Novartis now. Uh, and I can tell you about Meerkats for two seconds, or you can stop and ask me questions. Yes? So you mentioned um, that um, finding substitution models to apply this kind of framework, which I, I, I love that idea, uh, the phylogenetics of shapes, but how are you going to start to, what are, how can we start to get at what are right substitution models? I think that's a really hard part, right? So, so, so one suggestion, which I think Anjali, you made, right? Which is take Brownian motion. Just take all the coordinates on the shape and do Brownian motion, right? And, and that's actually not unreasonable. And we've actually started doing that a little bit, right? Is we think about, and this is more in the framework that Anuj was talking about. Think about these shapes as these infinite, like, kind of curves or these infinite objects, right? And then basically do Brownian motion on this big high dimensional space. And if I believe that all of my, when I run Brownian motion, right, if I make all of my time paths really short, they're probably not going to run through each other, right? So that's one model and one hope that you can do. What I'm hoping, and I haven't shown this yet, either empirically or mathematically, is once we transform it into one of some of these spaces, I can do Brownian motion in that space, right? And then shapes won't kind of run through each other, right? Brownian motion in this transformed space is somehow reasonable and proper. But I can't tell you that either empirically or mathematically. I mean, depending on how the shape is made, Brownian motion might or might not be appropriate to That's right. Space. That's also, yes. So maybe you could run an evolutionary model on the trait. It's, you know, you have your traits and you have your phylogeny. Let's, you know, an ideal kid situation. Maybe you could run an evolutionary model, model to tell you whether or not along certain lineages, Brownian motion was more likely that, or a better explainer than a different model of evolution. Exactly right. And then use that model to yeah. define your space. So, so I'll give you an example of where we did this. And again, this is work in Babylon's because it's with my wife. And we looked at methylation as a trait. And we looked at different lineages of baboons. And we asked, do you have Brownian motion or do you have you know, a drift term on any of these things? right? And we also you know, try to correct for what you think about the phylogeny. So, so we did that kind of with methylation. Uh, but that's univariate. And I know how to work with it, right? So extending that type of thinking to this is, I think, very interesting, but yeah. really hard. Yeah. There's, yeah. Um, there's a person who with Julian Clavel over in, well, he's just moved to London, but um, in Paris has been playing around with these approaches with OU models mm -hmm. um, and also you know some other mm -hmm. um, evolutionary models with multivariate data, even with actually really high dimensional data sets. He ran, he had a paper come out this summer using, I think, close to a thousand landmarks. I'll take a look at that. Rates. I'll take a look at that. Because yeah. um, we're doing something similar with Gaussian processes. Uh, and this is with Doug and Ingrid, and uh, you know it kind of works, but I, it's very hard for me to know what's right or wrong. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's Especially when you're trying to reconstruct the evolution of complex shapes. Yeah. 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 So this is. Um, yeah. If anyone wants to know about meerkats, you can ask me later. <laughs>
electrical computer engineering and does robotics. And Rob was actually applying a lot of these topological methods for motion planning and saying if I have kind of different paths, right? Can you tell me how many there are? Can you say how they can kind of be composed, right? Um, and, and then he had like uh, remote sensing applications for that, right? So, yes. Let me just know that we are enjoying this discussion. Yes. So you have these representation and you have a way of inverting them. Does it make sense to talk about averages in this space and inverting those statistics? That's averages? what I would like to do. That's once I get the inversion formula working. Right. I'd like to get averages, notions of clusters, variance in that space, and come back and show you cool pictures. Right, like the, yeah. not just the cool pictures, I think. No, but summaries. Like yeah, the yeah. summaries, because, you know, the, yes. like yes. the principal component, there is a lot to tell. What I really want to do is do straight up normal Bayesian statistics in this space, okay. and then come back. I mean, I have my own biases, but, yeah, but that's yes. Fine. But that's what, yes, yes, that's what I would like to tell you is a valid thing to do. I'd like to tell you, so that, that, that theorem that I showed you for that moduli space in terms of dimension, right. number of directions, right? Like, we did that because we did math and we wanted to submit a math paper, but the more reasonable, practical reason why we, need, we, want, we wanted to do something like that is I want to say, at least for some family of shapes, this transformed space is some notion of a linear vector space, right? And in this linear vector space, I can start doing more classical statistics and be okay with it. Right, and then you bring it back. And you bring it be, back. A, be, be able to judge the choice of metric there, like which means are more meaningful, which averages. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there there are a lot of so there's something else that I didn't say. So I lied in a way. This whole talk in a way is a lie, right? Because I told you I did everything without registration, right? And that's a that's a complete in a way bullshit because I had to have them registered to be able to say these things are similar. Right? In, in, in all the approaches that I told you. The only approach that would work without the registration is thinking about the directions and random. Mm -hmm. Okay? But again, when you start thinking about the directions and random, there is an implicit registration sitting kind of un underneath everything, right? So, in some way, I really like this picture of having these points, right? And you put things that you care about above these points, right? And parts of them move nicely, parts of them don't even, I think it's a physical space model. I think something similar is going to be true, right? And, and this way of how to partition that, I think, is, is interesting. More questions? Sorry. So, with the non model, like, uh like you, one way you were talking about doing it with Brownian motion, so you just have the surface a little bit random. But if, if you, if it might be worth to have it, then you could simulate it, simulate it physically. Yeah. For, like by growing parts of the bone. That's exactly right. So I have my biases. I'm a random person. If I were a more deterministic, physically oriented person, and I think in this case, this other approach might be better is exactly what you're doing. You actually build developmental models. You write down developmental models. You have parameters. You grow teeth or you grow whatever you want from those. That gives you your null model or that gives you your null set, and you work with that, right? I, I just don't do that because that's not how I roll, right? But that's a perfectly reasonable and maybe better way of thinking about this problem developmentally. We are talking about morphogenesis, so maybe, maybe that's a better way. <laughs> but even then, those models themselves also have biases. So you might say, okay, I think that, you know, the more curvature you have, the, the more you will grow. So you will elaborate upon something. Right. But that, you're assuming a molecular model that leads, or a physical model that leads to elaboration, which you've also decided gets yes. the data best. Yeah. So you're still, I think, in that complicated space where you're deciding, it's still super best. It's still super best. There's, there's one last comment that I was not for sure. Uh, when you, when a lot of people, when they do variable selection, classically, people think about sparsity. They only want to pull out a few points, right? Uh, in these types of models with shapes, sparsity does make, it makes no sense. Because if I believe that this point is relevant, all of its neighborhood points are probably relevant, right? And you probably also want to weight this somehow by curvature and things like that. So how to build those in there is also interesting. There are no more questions. There's lunch upstairs, but let's thank Anuj and Sai again.